We're going to go back to Galatians chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verses 1 through 5. We're going to stay there for a while, I think. Galatians. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Last week, we dealt with the first word, Paul. Today, we're probably going to deal with the next two words, an apostle. And I combine that with the rest of the uh, verses there, verses 1 through 5. So let me read them so that we can have it in context. Is everybody still with me? Okay. I'm reading from the NIV. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers with me. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So I want to... uh, give a handle to this message, and it is faith, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the call of an apostle. The call of an apostle. So I'm going to deal with three things, hopefully uh, quickly, and uh, the more I do this message, the more I go into it, the more I'm convinced that I'm going to allow you, if you have questions while I am preaching, to raise your hand. Okay? And I I would like to engage with you. Um, And I, this this reminds me a long time ago uh, before Dick and Roy Morgan. Dick and Stan. (laughs) Please stand. I just want everybody to know who, who I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> All right. You may be seated. Uh, it's, been, it's been a long time ago, but, uh, but that was his first time at the Village Baptist Church. And he stopped me while I was preaching. <laughs> to ask a question. And I could see the face of his mother. <laughs> going, you're not supposed to do that. (laughs) But he's a deacon now, praise God. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, three things, the characteristics of an apostle. Who is an apostle? That's the first thing we're trying to deal with. Paul called himself an apostle, so we need to know what that means. The second is the call of an apostle. In this particular case, we want to look at the origin of his call. Was it human or was it divine? Okay. And lastly, we'll look at the caller of the apostle who called him. I call this a Christological or and soteriological confession. Okay. Uh, all right. We, we're there. We're getting there little by little. Okay. Paul called himself an apostle. You may ask, what is the difference? Why is he calling himself an apostle? Or secondly, we can ask the question, are there apostles today? Or was apostleship limited to the 12 disciples? If it was limited to the 12 disciples, How then can Paul call himself an apostle? Because he was not part of the original. Are you with me? 
Okay. So in the Greek, it said, Paulus, Apostolos, Uk, Ap, Anthropu, okay, Aladia, Jesu Christu. Oh, Paul, an apostle, he didn't even say his usual way of saying it in the other epistles by saying, of Jesus Christ or Desmius Jesu Christu or the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in this case, it's very important because he was writing to the Galatians. And one of the things that we have already established was the problem in Galatia was the Judaizers. Are you still with me? Who are the Judaizers? Those of you that were here last week. Someone answer for me. Who were the Judaizers? Okay, come up, come up here. I have a drink for you. All right, okay. Don't drink it all by yourself. <laughs> so, the Judaizers in the Galatian churches... And sometimes Paul will write a letter to a church, okay? In this case, he wrote it to churches, and people have been arguing with this churches in the north or churches in the south. They call the Galatian churches. But it doesn't matter whether it's the south or the, or, the, or the north, but what it means is that there were a group of churches that were among the people that were being uh, persecuted given wrong teaching by these people called the Judaizers, okay? And we explained last week that the problem of the Judaizers uh, is very important for us to understand it because the Judaizers were people who were Jews, okay? And they became Christians. In the old time, in the time that we're talking about that Paul was writing and was talking to people, it was not a strange thing to have a Jew become a Christian. What was strange in those days was to have a Gentile become a Christian. So the church started having a lot of Gentiles become Christians because Paul has taken it upon himself to call himself an apostle to the Gentiles. So it's now witnessing to Gentiles and Gentiles are becoming Christians and they are becoming Christian at an alarming number. So the question that the church had to deal with was we are a Jewish people. A Jewish race. And we are followers of Jesus Christ, who is also a Jew. Now we have Gentiles coming in. And because we are Jewish, we have Jewish customs. Things that we do. Like circumcision. Like eating food that is clean. Not eating meat of Animals that did not chew the cord. Uh, on and on and on and on. So in other words, in the today's language, we eat kosher food. Okay? And these people are coming in, and they did call them these people in those days. Okay? They're coming in. They, what now? We have to really make them become Jews before they can become Christians. Therefore, we have to require that they be circumcised. We have to require that they stay away from certain foods. We have to require that they start observing certain days and months and festivals. Paul said, no. No, 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 no. That's not the faith that Jesus handed out to us. In fact, if you remember, even the, the writers of the Gospels 
have already maintained that when Jesus was living, he gave us a command. And the command was not just go to the Jews. Right? What we call the Great Commission, what did it say? And ye shall, what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Therefore, go ye into all nations. Even in Acts of the Apostles, when saying ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come up upon you, and you will be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And, and by the way, this is a side issue. Some people think that the way you interpret that is you got to start in Jerusalem, then you go to Judea, then you go to Samaria, then you go to the uttermost part of the earth. No, it's not saying that. It's saying these are all the places you need to go witness. Okay, so let's get back to Paul. So Paul is now writing to this church. And in his usual way of greeting them, and it, it didn't start like that way. This is the one letter that didn't start that way. That's another letter, but this is one of the letters. He said, hey, listen, I am an apostle. And I am not an apostle from man. Let's, let's take a little bit of uh, walk through this, okay? So if you look at Mark chapter 3. Mark, I'm sorry I didn't give this to you guys. Mark chapter 3. Verses uh, 14. Mark chapter 3. Verses 14. Is that okay? Okay. And it reads went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, son of Zebedee. And his brother John. To them he gave the name Pogenes, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Okay, so this is the list that is given. And if you look at Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, and Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, you will see the list of this also. He designated them to be apostles. Are you still with me? So, those same 12 apostles are also frequently called disciples. And Jesus also called us disciples. So, the question is, what is really the difference between an apostle and a disciple. Let me just make a simple statement. While all apostles are also disciples, not all disciples are apostles. Okay? You can hold on to that. And we'll get a little bit deeper into it. Okay. So, The term disciple comes from the world of mathematics. In fact, our word, English word mathematics, 
is actually from the Greek word disciple. The word is mathetes. So a disciple is one who is studying under a teacher. A disciple is one who is learning from a master. So they were disciples and Jesus said, you go out and you make disciples. Okay. You know, I really want to emphasize this because we are all disciples. Because that's what Jesus wants us to make. Right? If you're not studying, are you a disciple? That is the basic meaning of the word. Many of us will leave things in our Bible and we can't find them. Because we usually don't look at it until maybe it's time to come to church. It's a shame that we will call ourselves disciples. Please, please, please forgive me. If this is your first time listening to me, (laughs) you're probably going to have a problem. (laughs) I really don't get it when you call yourself a disciple and you're allergic to the Bible. How else are you going to learn about what Jesus wants you to do and how he wants you to live? Not only preachers should be studying the Bible. Not only deacons should be studying the Bible. Not only Sunday school teachers should be studying the Bible. We are all learners in the school of Jesus Christ. Please don't be allergic to the Bible. And I say that some of you are going to say amen, but the last Wednesday of the month, I won't see you here. The first thing, the one thing that every Christian can claim to be is you are a disciple. You are a follower of Jesus Christ. You are a learner in the school of Jesus Christ. You are in the Jesus Christ movement. And the only way that you can be in that movement and do what God wants you to do in that movement is to be very, very, very familiar with the Bible, to study it, study it to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed and rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, the word disciple is the most common word that is used. So all of the disciples, all of the apostles, All of the Christians in the early Christian movement were all disciples. That wasn't the name they called them. They also called them the followers of the way. And then a new name came up. And that's the name we are all most used to right now. But it was not used until they were very popular in Antioch. They were Christians. And by the way, you can't be a Christian without Christ. You're just an Ian. There are a lot of Ians in the church. So the 
twelve were very, very important. So Paul said, I am an apostle and I am not from man. But let's deal with it again. If you look at the book of Acts and the Gospels, mostly they were called disciples. But they were also called apostles, so it could be confusing. Not everyone that was in the movement in the early church could be called an apostle. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And that passage is very important. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to talk about it later on also. If you give me about 15, 20 more minutes, I'll be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And when you read verse... uh, This is Paul writing about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he said, for what I received, verse 3, what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Listen to verse 5. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So if you look at this, and then you look at Romans chapter 16, verse 7. I'm going somewhere. Just follow me a little bit. Romans chapter 16. And verse 7. Listen to what he said there. He said, Greet Andronicus and Junius, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. You want me to read it again? Let me read so you can get it. And by the way, Junior is the name of a woman. So listen, listen to what he says. It says, greet Andronicus and Junius, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. Now, of course, you can take it two ways. You can say they were outstanding apostles or they were outstanding as they worked with the apostles. People have taken it either way. But what just surprises me is that not only here, but if you look at Acts chapter 14, you will see that Paul also uses the word apostle to refer to Barnabas. Barnabas was not one of the twelve. So generally speaking, the word apostolos, apostle, apostoli, apostolois, apostolone, whatever form it takes means one that is sent out. One that is sent out. And I don't mean to belittle it by just saying we are all apostles, which is not true. But an apostle would be one who is sent out to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to people everywhere. If the only place where you stay is Oakland, you cannot be an apostle. An apostle is not geographically limited. 
Are you still following me? In other words, you go beyond your locality. You go beyond where you are in order to spread the gospel. That was why Paul is known as one of the most important apostles. Even though he was not part of the twelve. Are you still with me? Okay. Now, I want to deal with this because I think it's really important. Paul said, Paul, an apostle, Paul, an apostle, not. Okay? So, he defines himself negatively. And then he defines himself positively. That is his call. Paul is now establishing his call. He said, Paul, an apostle, sent not from man, nor by man, but by Jesus. Paul is very emphatic, and that's why he played this first. I know somebody was trying to help me instead of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't want to say of Jesus Christ right away. He wanted to make sure they don't mix him. Amen? Amen. We have a lot of apostles today on TV. That I don't want you to mix me with them. Paul, an apostle, the origin of my call is not human. A true apostle has only one legitimate source of calling from God. Are you with me? That's why churches need to be very careful who you call to come be your pastor. You need to be very careful about that. Churches need to pray when you need a pastor. Because you don't want somebody that just has a certificate. One of my favorite preachers of all time, Charles Spurgeon, refused to be ordained. He said, I don't want your dirty hands on my empty head. Some people just think just because, you know, they've gone to seminary and they have a few people that gather together and ask them questions and they give them a certificate say, your license, your ordained, that means they are called of God. You better be careful. I remember some people, some people at village got mad at me. And I said, it's okay, get mad at me. As long as I'm doing God's will. I've had some people come to me and say, God called me. I said, well, okay. I said, you go, you got to preach. It's called you to preach, right? You got to preach. I used, to, I used to do that. I don't tell people you're going to preach. I get to church on Sunday and say, you're preaching today. And you get there, you can't preach. God didn't call you. Amen. One of them preached. I'm not going to say whether it's a man or a woman. And I said, what was that? People were telling me I did what I said, yeah. People will tell you that. But where I was sitting, that was no preaching. You give people things that their itchy ears want to hear. I said, no, you whatever that sermon is, go pray over it. Let the Lord cook it for you. Yeah. 
And I'm going to schedule you to preach again. You have only one more chance. I gave them that chance. They didn't use it well. And I said, no more. And they left and went to another church. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is still testifying. <laughs> you got to do the right thing. You got to do the right thing. You cannot say, I am called to preach because I just love to preach. Amen. Charles Spurgeon also had a school. And uh, he will give people interviews that are coming to the school to be trained to become preachers. And one day he asked one of his uh, students, potential student, because he never got to be a student. What's a potential student? He said, why are you coming to this school? He said, I had a vision. Reverend Spurgeon said, what was the, speech, uh, the uh, vision? He said, right in my vision, three letters came to me. GPC. GPC. He said, what does that mean? Go preach Christ. And after the interview, uh, Spurgeon said, let me interpret the vi vision for you. The GPC stands for go plant corn. <laughs> Paul wanted to make it very clear. My calling is not from men. I'm not doing this because I just love to talk. I'm not doing this because I just want to lead a group of people. I'm not doing this because I just want to fight. He said, no, if you knew my history, you know I already had the authority. I was already persecuting the church. I was already a man that was listened to. I was a Pharisee of Pharisee. Regarding all of my contemporaries, I was above them. But all of that I counted as garbage. For the excellency of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who called me into this gospel. So Paul is saying my calling is not by the instrumentality of man. I know you know about Peter. You know about James. You know about the, all the apostles who were pillars of the church. None of them added anything to me. Now, I know that today you probably hear some people that call themselves apostles. A lot of them in Oakland. <laughs> so, when Paul is calling himself an apostle, he is not talking about the gift of apostleship. Are you with me? Because in the church, there are some people that the Holy Spirit has given the gift of apostleship to. How do you define that? How do you define that gift of apostleship? I already defined it for you in our membership handbook because I know the gift of apostleship, and I'm reading from the membership handbook, is extraordinary ability given to certain members of the body of Christ to realize and put into practice the mandate of reaching the world for Christ and establishing churches wherever the need exists. These gifted individuals have the rare ability to lead and establish churches with divine authority and success. And sometimes some people have called this the gift of foreign missionary 
or the gift of missionary and foreign preachers. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, the gift of apostleship. But the type of apostleship that Paul is talking about has been argued and talked about and scholars and students of the Bible have agreed over the years that the gift of apostleship that Paul is talking about is characterized by three things. One is you must be a witness of the resurrection. Amen? How many people in Oakland witnessed the resurrection? <laughs> if you're from Oakland, please forgive me. So in order for you to group a person in that particular special group that I call apostles, you must have witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can talk about Paul later on. Number two. You must have been appointed by the Lord himself. How many from Oakland? And the last, the third point, please, this is really important because there are a lot of people who claim this and I, I have no problem with people claiming things, okay? But show some power and something behind it. So scholars and New Testament students over the years have said the other third thing you must be able to do is authenticate your title of apostleship with miracles and signs and healings. Hello, Oakland. I'm almost done. So we saw the two negatives Paul pointed out to, to us I am not from man, and I did not become an apostle by the instrumentality of any man. Now he's going to get into the positives. And this is a statement which I call a Christological and soteriological confession. Verses 4 and 5. But before we get to verses 4 and 5, let me talk real quickly with verses uh, 2. And three, you know, when you start reading the book of Galatians, I want you to open it up and say, wow, that's what it means. Okay, I'm, I'm not here to preach you happy or anything. I just want you to learn. Are you with me? Okay, so in, in verse two, it said, and all the brothers with me. That's the reason why Paul wrote that. He said, I'm writing you this letter. And I have some with me right now. I'm speaking for all of them. I want you to know I'm not writing this letter by myself. There are a lot of other people who are upset with you. In fact, very soon I'm going to call you foolish. But for now, I want you to know that we are not happy with you. All the brothers that are with me. And he said, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say that just in case. He loses it. So they know he still wants the peace and the grace of God to be with them. Amen. 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 Sometimes when I preach, I do want the grace and peace of God to be with you. I'm serious. Because nothing, nothing can satisfy your soul than the grace of God. 
nothing can keep you in your right mind than the peace of God. I don't care how many doctors you go to, how many psychologists you go to, how many advisors you go to, how many counselors you go to. If you miss going to Jesus, you may not get your answer. Paul said, I want you to know this. The only thing that's keeping you alive right now is the grace and peace of God. And then he said, let me confess. He came through Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. That that is the greatest Christological and soteriological confession of all time. Jesus gave himself. Nobody forced him to. In fact, one place he said, I gave my life and I can pick it back up again. When he was in the garden of Gethsemane. And he was looking for the agony of what was going to happen to him. He said, Father, take this cup away from me. But nevertheless, I'm going if you want me to go. I'm going to do it for Emmanuel if you want me to. I'm going to do it for Denise if you want me to. I'm going to do it for Mark if you want me to. I'm going to do it for Rosalind, if you want me to. I don't care what it takes. Father, I will go. The greatest Christological confession. You know, Christianity is Christ. I want you to get that. Write it down. Christianity is Christ. You cannot have Christianity without Christ. Hello? Your Christian confession is about Christ. What you think of Christ... That is what is going to determine your eternity. Amen. You can be good in eschatology. You can be good in bibliology. You can be good in pneumatology. But if you're not good in Christology, you cannot have soteriology. I'm telling you what you think of Christ is going to determine your state and your skin. If you can't do well with Christ, you cannot do well with anything. Amen. If you can't do well with Christ, you can put your tithes in your pocket. He doesn't want it. If you can't do well with Christ, you can put your worship somewhere else. Amen. You can raise your hand all you want to. But if Jesus is not at the top of your theology, you have messed up. Hallelujah. I just want to confess with Paul. Just be with me for one more minute and I'll be done. I'll shut up and go sit down. Grace and peace. There is no grace without God. Grace is the watchword of Paul. Grace Oh, somebody said, amazing grace. How sweet that sounds. Grace is the word for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Without any reservation. Pour it down their life for the poor lost sinners like you and me. Grace. Grace is God stooping down. To touch all of our insignificances and poverty. Grace. Grace is not just the name of a woman. Grace is the name of God. Grace is the character of God. Grace is the action of God. Grace is the power of God. Grace. Grace. Grace of our mighty God. Hallelujah. Only grace. Oh, I wish I could be with Paul right now. It's a grace and peace. 
Yes. When you have caris, a rainy comes with it. Caris, grace, and a rainy peace. Their bodies, they don't separate. If you don't have peace, it's because you don't have grace. You better watch it. If your life is too much in commotion, come to the grace of God. Amen. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sins. Woo. Grace. That's why I like Galatians. It's about grace. It's not about what you do. It's not about what you have done for God. It's about grace. It's not about your morality. Ooh, thank you. I got all excited. <laughs> grace. I can't define it. But because grace is too much. Grace. When you think you're worth it, you're not really worth it. Amen. You didn't do anything for grace. You ask God, how do you love me? How much love do you have for me? He said, grace. Grace from all eternity. I love you even when you were not born. Grace. I love you when you were in your sins. Grace. But God demonstrated his love toward us in a while we were yet sinners. Grace died for us. Grace is so so much I can't even think about it. Thank God for grace because grace will bring you peace. Grace will bring you joy. Grace will bring you satisfaction. Grace will bring you healing. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's close our eyes for a second.